you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. Well, as is our uh, custom, we return to the subject of health regularly because you tell us that you're interested in it, and we already know that you are, in addition to which we're in this historic pandemic, which seems to have enveloped all of the world right now to some extent. Yes. And, and there's such debate and controversy and confusion about what is the best way to attack this, what should be the policies of cities and countries and individuals. So we wanted to come back to a guest for today who's been very popular in the past. Many of you will, will remember Dr. John Morley. He's a professor uh, at St. Louis University's Division of Geriatric Medicine. He has uh, quite a reputation uh, nationally and internationally. So we thought, who better to comment on the pandemic and its relationship to people who are older, his geriatric focus? Yes. And Dr. Morley, the last time you were on, I remember you saying that hopefully the next time I'm a guest on the show, we won't be talking about the pandemic, but we're circling back. This pandemic isn't going away. At any rate, we're glad to have you back on the show. It's great to be back, guys. Looking forward to talking with you and your people who are listening. So let's start out by, I guess, talking about the confusion that exists nationally about whether we should be locked down, whether the entire economy should be briefly placed on hold and that people sequester themselves, or whether there, in fact, now seems to be a better way than was originally thought. And I want you to comment also, if you would, on this thing called, I think it's called the Great Barrington Declaration, where a number of, of uh, authorities, a growing list of people are signing on to it, which is asking for a solution other than, is recommending a solution other than simply the lockdown. And it's suggesting kind of a more nuanced approach. And these are all healthcare professionals who are signing this thing. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with that, Dr. Morley? A little bit. Uh, you know, it's sort of healthcare professionals getting most probably a little bit out of where they want to be. Uh, but yes, uh, we can talk a little bit about the approaches. And I have read the, the letter, so I do know what it's about. So tell me what your impressions are as an insider and an authority, so to speak, on what you're seeing in the news in this debate. So I think the first thing to recognize is that lockdown is a alternative when you do a very bad population health job to start with. So I think we've got to recognize that the United States is way up in the death rates, and that's per number of population compared to almost anywhere else in the world. I mean, we're doing Compared to Taiwan or Singapore, we're doing dreadfully. Uh, compared to uh, Brazil, we're still sort of not doing any better. You know, it's really very sad. What a terrible job we've done. And you have a terrible job when your leaders don't lead. And I think that's the answer we've got to face is that we have had very poor leadership particularly from our politicians. Realistically, the first thing, if you want to get rid of the COVID and make it bearable for people, is people have to wear masks and remember to wash their hands. Very simple things to do. There's nothing wrong with wearing a mask. It doesn't make you less of a man or a woman. So where do you need lockdown? You need lockdown when things get totally out of control. And we've had a time where it was totally out of control. Other countries have done lockdown in the same way. Lockdown is not a ideal thing because you create a loneliness and you don't want to do it if you can help it. But if you've got far too much virus running around, it may be the only way to stop it. You know? So I think we've got to recognize that if we want to get through this, we can be saved perhaps by a working vaccine, which may come sometime, most probably not before the spring of next year or maybe the autumn, depending on how many side effects they have and whether or not 
we can actually show they work because it's no use having a vaccine out there that doesn't work. So we need a working vaccine that takes large numbers of people who've got to go through studies and that takes time. And you can't say you're going to stop something like COVID because a week after you give them a vaccine, nobody gets COVID. So I think we've got to recognize that lockdown is not good, but we're trying very hard to force ourselves back into it, I think, because we're not doing anything else properly. So I hope everybody listening, and particularly the younger people listening, should recognize that if they care about their older parents, their grandparents, if they don't wear a mask and they don't wear it regularly, they're going to finish up carrying this into their uh, uh, grandparents' and parents' homes, and that will be the problem. And there doesn't seem to be anybody who doesn't carry it. You know, people keep on saying, well, children don't get as much, which is partly true. They don't get as much, but when they get it, they're just as infectious as anybody else. They just get over it much better than us old folk. All right, Dr. Morley, we had talked before on this show about the CDC distorting numbers. There was that story that came out. Then more recently, the CDC retracting information, um, not to mention health organizations where there has been discrepancies. So having said all of that, how can the American people really trust these numbers? Well, the problem we have is I think most of the people in the CDC, in the uh, NIH and other places are relatively honest. I think they do make mistakes. And, uh, you know, uh, Fauci right at the beginning said maybe wearing a mask is not essential. And he's since retracted that. And that's part of science. So I think we make mistakes. I think the problem is that when you then have politicians say you can't make mistakes unless you make the mistakes we want you to. And, you know, the people who run these large organizations are really politicians. You don't go to run the CDC because you're a great scientist. You might by mistake, but you really go there because you like to tell other people what to do. That's how I look at it. And they'll tell me this isn't fair, but that's how I see the people who want to be administrative types in, in medicine. You know, So I think the first part to recognize is a lot of the recent information that has come out has been pushed by politicians saying, look, this is what we want. This is what you can say. But here's here's what frustrates me, and you can kind of give me your response to this as a physician. If you ask anybody in their particular profession to comment on some phenomenon, they're going to view it entirely through the lens of their profession. And as likely, they're going to regard that as the most important aspect of the problem. And so it seems that what the great Barrington, this declaration uh, represents, as I understand it, is the conclusion that locking down an economy in the interest of, of saving lives, with that being its motive, fails to recognize the cost on the other side of the scale, which, of course, yeah, it's economic. And, and while some people don't as clearly see the bloodline from from the economic consequences to the health consequences, they're there. I mean, depression, mm-hmm. unemployment, and all those hardships. But even directly on the health side, how many people, and will we ever know, died from things that were not diagnosed during this period of this lockdown? And I can tell you that I know specifically a funeral that I went to three weeks ago of a guy whose mother is very bitter. Uh, he had had health problems his whole life, and, and he uh, he had made it through a heart transplant and other organ transplants as a child. And he ends up dying of a cancer that his doctor says without equivocation. I mean, it, and he said that had he come in here as he normally would when he started having these symptoms in March, this was a cancer we could have defeated. And he said because he comes in to us, he was permitted to have an appointment to come in months later. And, and this is just the only case I know of, but, but I, I, I know that there have to be many things that were not diagnosed during this lockdown because people didn't get in or they were afraid to go in, whatever the reason. I know in my case, I couldn't get in to see a doctor. I think it, it's naive of, of many people in the healthcare field to think who supported lockdowns because they thought, well, look, on the one side of the scale, you have dollars. I have an ENT physician who's very smart. She's at WashU. And she said to me, she said, well, look, on the one side you have dollars and on the other side you have lives. In other words, her position was unequivocal. 
you know, do anything you can to save a life as she defined it and, and was completely dismissive about the economic consequences. So the danger of allowing people in the health field to make social policy decisions, I mean, we do elect elected officials, whether we like them or not, let's assume it's Obama rather than Trump. I mean, I think more people be willing to say, well, yeah, he's the one who's supposed to look at the big picture, and he's the one who's supposed, and this is not that offense of Trump, so let, let's stick with Obama, if Obama were president. So, it, you know, we, we would say, well, yeah, Obama is charged with looking at the totality of the picture and making these decisions. And, uh, and instead, you know, there's this insistence that we look only at what you know, the, the health professionals are telling us to do. Now, this is a devil's advocate argument, doctor, so I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Okay, so let's start off and get the politics out of the way. Cuomo yeah. in New York did as bad a job killing people as Mr. Trump has done. He sent tons of people and insisted they went out of the hospital to nursing homes. And remember, 40% of the deaths at the moment are in nursing homes. That is the pitch wow. for where people are going to die. And, uh, you know, lockdown in the nursing homes, I can argue, is not being a positive, but part of the reason it's not been a positive is that fundamentally we could have got away with a lot of it if there'd been enough PPE, if there'd been enough tests available and a variety of other things. So when it started, nobody knew what to do. I think I had, I can understand that. And I think basically we didn't do a good job with our population health people and our politicians didn't do a good job. So let's not blame anyone directly for this. Okay. I think. Yeah. We got to the stage now where it's clear that we're not going to solve the problem until people wear masks. Uh, lockdown itself is not that essential. And uh, my original talk with one of the people working with Mr. Pence was that we shouldn't lock down, but we should wear masks. Uh, they clearly thought that I was giving them a democratic viewpoint and they didn't listen to a thing I said. So that made me feel really well because I had to sit and think before I gave them the answer. Do I want to give them <laughs> a really bad answer or do I want to give them a one that will help people? And I went with the one I thought would help people. So I think we've got to recognize that yes, lockdowns can be tremendously bad. They can make people very lonely, depressed. They can get sick. The failure to provide at least telehealth early on uh, for everybody and to allow people to get to see physicians was just ridiculous and inappropriate, you know. So we've done lots of inappropriate things and we've all been responsible for some of that. And maybe we've learned from it too, though, do you think? I mean, I keep on hoping, but, you know, uh, I, I've lived in America for 44 years now, and some days I don't think that the 44 years I've lived here were any better than the 30 years I lived in South Africa. Both governments do ridiculous things. This was before we had Mandela and the government actually functioned sort of in South Africa, and then before they got the other people and stopped functioning again, you know. So we've got to recognize that we just are not very bright as a human uh, race some days, I think. But let's yeah. say we could do better. And I think better is certainly everybody has to wear a mask and there has to be no excuse for that. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to stop things. We've got to be able to test and trace and we've got to be able to do it a little quicker than the two weeks it was at one stage where the results were coming back two weeks later, which is far too late you know, to stop somebody spreading the disease. So I think we've got to recognize that we have done poorly. We've done worse than Sweden, who went for herd immunity, but actually most of the people still wore masks and kept their distance to some extent. There is a cultural difference. I mean, Americans are just notoriously um, kind of independent and, and rebellious. And, and I think Norwegians, you know, they're, they're people who are willing to follow rules, I think. They're much better at doing that than we are. Let's put it this way. And then, of course, the Germans have done really well, but they're really good at following uh, rules. And you go to Singapore where you follow rules or your life is not going to be there, you know. Yeah. So, And it's a democracy, but it's a democracy where you have to follow rules, you know. And Taiwan did the same thing. So you could have controlled this if we'd done the right things. We have to recognize we didn't. We have to recognize we have to back off and do the right things. Wearing masks are important. I think, you know, that not if you're 
older, say 70 plus, not going out in crowds, it makes sense, uh, not going to a restaurant at the moment to eat because certainly inside is not something you should be doing if you're older. And if you go outside, you should go places where you can socially distance and wear a mask and hope that people around you are wearing a mask. Uh, as you get younger, it's less important, but younger people do die. So, And it's not only sick people who die. Some people seem to have a genetic predisposition to get COVID very badly, and we've got to recognize that. And we've also got to recognize that as we're seeing now a subset of people who got COVID weren't that sick, but now are going into four to six months of still being sick. So uh, there are a whole sort of things that can happen to you. And to fix this, we've got to start being rational. Rational is wearing a, a mask, having good uh, testing and tra tracing. And then basically when people are traced and have the disease, uh, putting them in some sort of lockdown till it's gone, not going to Congress to talk to the next uh, uh, Supreme Court justice when you're still within the two weeks you're supposed to be, you know, and those are things you don't want to do, you know, if you can possibly. Right. And doctor, you know, getting back to the healthy people, people with no underlying medical conditions that are getting sick from this disease, severely ill, and, and there have been several studies on this. I believe Stanford did one, Yale. Uh, and and they're, they have an immune system that's overactive, and that's what causes them to get sick, or, or that's the theory anyway. Can you talk about that? That's really fascinating to me. Yeah, so we know that the coronaviruses all have different effects. Some of them are very lethal. Some of them aren't. The effects that they have are dependent on what they, they, how they handle the immune system and whether or not they can control it, whether or not they can make it go totally out of control. This is the basic uh, sort of uh, COVID storms that we see, uh, you know, where uh, this is a, a major problem where the COVID causes the immune system to go totally crazy. And we've got to recognize that's going to happen. We've got to recognize that COVID has an incredible ability to get into almost any cell in the body. And we haven't worked out now why, you know, it doesn't just stay in the nose or go from the nose to the lung, but you can see problems in the liver, you can see it in the kidney, you can see it in virtually every every single organ in the body. Uh, it causes heart disease, you know. Uh, Rodriguez, uh, who was the uh, a, a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, had to stop playing after his COVID because because he got a myocarditis and he wasn't strong enough to play and had to stop baseball for the rest of the year. So even young, healthy people, COVID can find its way around. How the T cells do that, we're not too certain, but we know that it's most probably more than just antibodies, but the T cells making their own decisions as they con uh, conduct an uh, immune orchestra all over the body and say, yeah, Maybe this is what we should do. And gee, I really like Mr. COVID. Come here. Let's have fun together. You know, and that seems to be what happens with some people. So, well, would it be wise to get checked for that? Do some sort of genetic testing to see if you are one of these individuals that has an overactive immune system? Well, at the moment, we don't know who those people are. You know, we see the same thing with other viral illnesses. You know, infectious mononucleosis uh, can do it. Uh, we have uh, basically uh, uh, Q fever and other types of viral diseases that do the same thing. Some people get better straight away. Other people get really sick with them. So this is not an abnormal occurrence with viruses. Uh, we don't have at the moment, a genetic idea of who those people are. So we know that the COVID itself has at least two or three different genetic forms, and some of the things that go wrong may be one of the uh, forms that is different. We don't know for sure. So there are a whole lot of things going on, and we're not there yet. You know, this is like any pandemic People rush in, try and f find all the answers quickly. But, you know, we know that every year the flu virus 
works on about 40% of people to about 80% of people. And we haven't quite worked out how to get a virus or flu that will work on all of us each year, you know. So we've got a long way to go to understand this. And I don't think we can blame anyone. You know, realistically, nature is incredibly good at creating ways to keep its creatures alive. And we've got to recognize that the COVID-19 is a creature that's learned how to do enough damage to keep itself going. President Trump falls in that high risk group. What do you make that he bounced back so quickly? Remdesivir, wasn't it? Well, or some know, cocktail? He got everything that was available to humankind. He'd previously taken hydroxychloroquine, and he's lucky that didn't kill him. We still don't know whether he'll have any side effects from the drugs he took, you know. So, And we don't really know that he is really better. People with COVID, some of them have a bad moment. They look like they're better, and then they get much worse. I'm assuming that's not going to happen with him. I hope it's not going to happen with him. But he hasn't been long enough for us to know for sure that he is actually cured of COVID. And that's getting everything we thought might work. And, you know, the data for it working, steroids work, oh, in about 2 to 5% of people. So a very small percentage who it's given to actually do better. Remdesivir makes you be sick for a day less, and that's not saying very much. And the convalescent plasma, we assume it works, but the data is still a long way away from us being able to say it's actually working. Uh, You know, he might have been somebody who was genetically protected from it. Uh, We don't know, and we know that there are lots of people who don't get really sick with it. So, you know, there are lots, about half of the people who get COVID have totally no symptoms at all and just get better. It worries me really when I hear somebody say, well, COVID isn't a problem because I managed to handle it. No, you were just lucky, I think, is the way we've got to look at it. I've seen several studies that that are persistent and I, uh, regarding vitamin. D. And and last time you were on the show, I mentioned to you, and you were very dismissive, Um, but there continue to be some studies that are done since then that, and I don't know if they were large studies, these were in, I think, the UK. I'm just thinking something that's free and widely available, uh, why would it not be suggested, even if there was some reasonable possibility that it could be helpful? Well, We realism, and I think we talked about this last time, is how do you get a low vitamin D? You get a low vitamin D by not going out into the sunlight. Who doesn't go out into the sunlight? People who are sick, people who are tired, people who are in lockdown don't go into the sunlight. So they're not getting vitamin D. And all the data that I've seen up till now that says that vitamin D uh, is associated with COVID is in people where it's saying, These are people who got COVID, but they were most probably, most of them in lockdown, most of them weren't going out in the sunlight, and so they had low vitamin D. So we haven't proven one way or the other that vitamin D is good or bad. And this is true for the whole of the vitamin D literature. It's one of the, there are people with very low vitamin D who need vitamin D, but those are a small, small group of the people that we say have got low vitamin D. And and that's before we even get to COVID. So let's recognize that particularly in older people, you don't want to give somebody something when you don't know whether it's good or bad for you. High doses of vitamin D are clearly not good for people and you can get sick with high doses. So, you know, is it okay to take a thousand uh, international units of vitamin D a day? Most probably yes. Will that correct your vitamin D deficiency? In almost everybody, the answer is yes. So if you want to do it, it's most probably safe. We just don't know for sure because that data doesn't exist in people who don't have very severe vitamin D deficiency, which is not what the average physician will tell you is vitamin D deficient. So, you know, we're living in a world where we don't always know the answers and we are very good at making up answers. What do you mean you can get sick from very high doses of vitamin D? Can you explain? High vitamin D 
will basically cause you to have high calcium. High calcium is not very good for you. Uh, you know that people who take too much calcium finish up getting heart disease, they die earlier. So that is one example of what high doses of vitamin D can do to you. And high vitamin D also will interfere with the way you're thinking by pushing the calcium too high. You know, we were created by God to say, this is a perfect way to be not created to say, well, we should do and take extra mega doses of things. It's taking uh, extra vitam vitamins. The, the data is very good now that if you take vitamins, basically, and you don't need them, you're going to be just more likely to die, about 1% more likely to die than the people who don't take vitamins. And that's from all the placebo studies. It took forever to get enough people to show that, but the Cochrane meta-analysis showed that's true. So taking things that we think are safe are not necessarily safe. And you need huge studies to show in something that has a 1% or 2% chance of killing you that it actually did. And that's what they did eventually with the multivitamins. I don't know that the vitamin D will come out that way, but I don't think that the data is very good to say that vitamin D does anything to fix COVID. Now, I may prove myself wrong, and I've been wrong many, many times in my life. And the only thing that makes you a better physician than the people who don't know they're wrong are that at least by not knowing you're wrong, when there's good evidence that you were wrong, you can change. Doctor, the pandemic has lingered into the flu season. What's your outlook on that, especially when it comes to seniors? So it's fairly easy. If, if you are an anti-vaxxer and you don't get flu, you're most probably increasing your chances of dying. You're going to, nobody's going to know what's wrong with you when you come in with a fever or without a fever, but with the other symptoms that are classical of flu and classical of COVID. You will most probably finish up getting some wrong treatment along the way. And we have no idea what putting influenza together with COVID is going to do to the population. So certainly, I think everybody should get a flu vaccine. Not getting it is relatively to very silly. And I can't tell the anti-vaxxers that anything other than they don't read the literature well. So, you know, and I'm sounding horrible, and I'm sorry for the people out there who are now annoyed with me for saying this, but I want to keep people alive. I want to keep them happy and not using vaccines as one of the ways to reduce what could be otherwise an incredibly bad winter with a combination of influenza and COVID is just not acceptable in my mind. Well, you know, this is also the season where people get colds. What do we do? Run to the doctor or to a medical testing facility to test for COVID? Because the symptoms are very similar to COVID. Well, I think that really, if you th get a cold, we should have testing available for you to see if you've got COVID or to see if you've got influenza. I mean, that's what happens now. If you, you know, before we had COVID, if you get something that's sort of making you feel not so good, you've got what feels like the beginning of a cold, you go to see the doctor, they do an influenza swab to see if you've got influenza. We need to do the same with COVID. Right. But most of the time, people, when they get a cold, they don't go to the doctor. They take some over-the-counter medication. So are you saying that if you, you know, have cold-like symptoms that you should go get tested? You've got a high fever, you know, you should certainly go. And the problem is old people with COVID don't necessarily get the fevers. If you're getting a combination of fever and diarrhea, if you're uh, basically having headaches, not thinking well, any of that stuff, you need to go to the doctor. And there's no question about it that that makes a big difference and you should be doing it. You know, I can't tell you not to go to the doctor. Doctors should make a lot of money this coming winter. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And I think that now these tests are a lot more available, though there still is this waiting period of 48 to anywhere from two to four days yeah. before yeah. you can get answers to these questions. It, that's really frustrating. So the new antigen test is much quicker. The problem is we still haven't worked out which of them work really well and which ones don't. Uh, you know, when you tell the FDA everything's got to be put out and accepted straight away, that's when you run into trouble. And that's what happened. Uh, the politicians said, oh, aren't these things wonderful? I remember seeing one of the, the machine for one of the 
first tests, being uh, on the president's desk and telling us how it's going to be wonderful and everything. And that particular model didn't work very well at all. You know, so we need to have good antigen testing. It works very well. We need to have good PCR testing works well. It can be done fairly quickly uh, if we set it up and if we have a system where we work out who to test and test them when it's appropriate. Also, remember, if you get a cold, if you find suddenly you can't taste and you can't smell, that's highly suspicious of you having COVID. Uh, and if you get anorexia with it, so you don't want to eat as well, you're almost certainly going to finish up with COVID, perhaps with influenza. That's the time to go get tested. So it might affect your appetite too. It does affect your appetite fairly strongly. And we know that it also gives you muscle pain. And if you get it severely, you're going to get muscle wasting from the high cytokine levels. That's what we call cachexia. And if you've been in lockdown before that, you're going to lose lots of muscle uh, sarcopenia because you're not exercising. And one of the things that's important, even if you're in lockdown, is to make sure that you exercise because exercising is keeping your body healthy. And a healthy healthy body does seem to do better against COVID than an unhealthy body. Yeah. Yeah. And because so, cause when you exercise, it strengthens your immune system as well. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Doctor, let me ask you what your thoughts are on this. What about the idea of letting this virus run through the population that we build up an immunity? And I'm not talking about those who are most at risk, you know, seniors, and those with underlying health problems. What are your thoughts about that? Well, the example is Sweden, and Sweden did this. They did much worse than the rest of Scandinavia. They did worse than Germany. So the answer is, if you are happy to kill a three to four times the number of the population that you're going to get killed by doing nothing, then that's fine. But if you actually want to keep people alive, We've got to do the sensible things. And the sensible things, again, are wearing a mask. If you're old, trying to keep out of public places where lots of people, and particularly indoor public places. My daughter has been buying our our groceries for us now since the beginning of the COVID. And, you know, basically I told her she was crazy to start with. And she said, well, Dad, I want to keep you alive. And she's right. She has done something to keep my wife and I alive because there's no guarantee if we'd gone into a grocery store, we would not have finished up getting COVID and be dead now. So you have to work as a group where people at the least risk can go out more than the people who are at the higher risk. But you want to wear your mask. You want to do all the things that people don't want to do. And I don't know what else to say. You know, this is the problem. People don't want to hear that you've got to wear a mask. You've got to keep your six foot apart. You've got to wash your hands all the time. We do not know if we can get rid of COVID. That's going to be the other question we're going to face. We hope that COVID would disappear if everybody does the right stuff. And if it disappears, that's fine. Hopefully, if that doing the right stuff is not enough, we get a vaccine that helps make it disappear. But if we can't make it disappear, we're going to be wearing masks for a number of years to come, you know, and I think we've got to accept this. What do you think the long-term effects are going to be on senior citizens? Because they're isolated even, be, you know, before the pandemic, but even more so now. So we know we're going to have some loneliness. Interestingly, a number of people who were lonely before and have been isolated are less lonely. They seem to feed off the fact that people around them are also lonely. So it changes what you would expect, you know, which is that people would get worse. Some get worse, some get better with lockdown, but almost all of them with lockdown gets depression and anxiety that gets quite a bit worse. More importantly, again, I think we've got to recognize that there's a long COVID syndrome. And that is what we have to pay attention to, because I've seen a lot of people who've gone to doctors and they just said, ah, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just making it up. You know, you're a little tired or everybody's tired. Basically, you're, you've got red eyes, you know, you've got a little headache, you're coughing, uh, maybe some chest pain, you've lost some muscle, 
you're falling because you've got myalgia and pains in your muscle, joint pains, and all of this is normal and it's normal after a virus. It's not normal after a virus, but about 5 to 10% of people who get some of these viruses around the world do have syndromes like this, and COVID is clearly producing this type of syndrome. And in the other viral syndromes, it can last up to a year once you've got it. The long COVID is going to be terrible for old people, but it's also terrible for young people because it makes them start to behave like old people. They can't get around, they can't do things, and they don't understand why. So the warning is this is maybe the worst part of the COVID syndrome are these persistent symptoms. And hopefully we will... uh... You know, we will have it wrapped up in mid-year 21. I'm a little more optimistic than you, but I realize we don't know. Oh, I was hopeful it would be wrapped, wrapped up by about July, you know, this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember you saying that. Yeah. I am just basically recognizing that sun doesn't take it away, you know. Uh, I think our president told us that the summer would come and it would all go away, and somehow that didn't happen. I was optimistic that that would be true, too. I I'm optimistic that it will all be gone before the flu season gets here, you know, but it's no good being optimistic if we don't do the things we need to do to basically help it go away. And at the moment, we're not quite there. No, no. How long do you think it's going to be where we're not going to see where we're going to go back to pre-pandemic, where there's no social distancing, um, no mask? You're thinking 22, right? I'm thinking when we've got a good vaccine, and that's going to be part of the problem of not knowing there are a lot of vaccines being developed. Uh, Everybody who's made a vaccine is going to try and sell it uh, for as much money as they can, at least to the government. And uh, they're going to try and cover up how good or bad it is. So, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. That happens with a lot of drugs that come on the market as well. And so, you know, we need to find the best vaccine that really works. And when we've got that, I think basically the vaccine may have to be taken every year like the flu vaccine, but then we may not have to wear masks again. But remember that uh, when people started wearing masks, the flu season in parts of the world that were having flu actually went down. That's the other interesting thing their flu was less than we would, they, they expected. So the people who wore masks got rid of the flu and also didn't have as much problems with the COVID. So masks may be part of the future, uh, you know. And, uh, I, I, you know, I've always laughed when I go to Japan and I see all yeah. people wearing masks. And now I'm beginning to think that I was really stupid to laugh, you know. Uh, at least I can accept I'm really stupid, you know. Uh, you, it's we've got to accept that some of these things may be an important part of the future. We hope it's not going to be necessary for 12 months a year, 365 days a year. But until we get rid of stuff and it's starting to look better, we've got to do some of this stuff. Well, if if uh, Vladimir Putin is to be believed, they already have a vaccine and they're making it available to the world. Yeah, and it may be uh, true. The Chinese have already vaccinated the whole of their army. Uh, you know, really? You knew that, but that's one of the things. So, you know, and realistically, some some of that you could vaccinate people early. We could be vaccinating people now. We don't know the side effects, and we do see that some of these vaccines are having side effects, and they have to shut down to work out whether these are real side effects or not. But we've got to recognize that the way we could do it is take any vaccine that we think works and just give it to everybody and see if we get rid of things. Uh, That would be what I think the public is afraid of at this moment in time. And that's why they don't wear masks and stuff, because they think everything we tell them has no scientific base. Doctor, though, you know what I find very amusing about the mask? You're out driving and you see someone in the car, they're driving alone, no one else is in that car with them, and they have a mask on. 
come on, what's the point in that? Well, there's no point in that, but I prefer to see somebody doing that, getting out of the car and keeping their mask on, than somebody who basically is in the car without a mask, gets out of the car without a mask, goes indoors without a mask, and comes as close as they can to anybody around them so that they can spread their little COVID all around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, ways and, of looking at this, you know. And, yeah, and I, I think some of what I think you're referring to, Jill, is you interpret that as a kind of virtue signaling or something? Or just being Foolish. overly Yeah, okay, cautious. all right, you're making you know, a different point. Okay. You know, I, I just don't see what the need is when you're in the car by yourself. Well, there's no need yeah. if you're at home. You know, it's the same thing. And, uh, you know, if you and your wife are at home alone or your, uh, you know, your partner, there really is no need to wear masks because you're both going to be together and that's where it is. But if you go outside and you get close to people, there's a need to wear masks. Other people, and that includes your family. I mean, we've got Thanksgiving coming up and, you know, my family, uh, one works in a nursing home, uh, you know, and uh, actually oh, Lord. in a nursing mm. home. One's an administrator, one does activities in the nursing home. Uh, so that, I'm not going to have Thanksgiving you know, because we're not going to see them because we can't. No, I can see this that. Is properly, and I think it's unreasonable for me to do it, mainly because they keep on coming and asking me for money at different times. Uh, and basically, <laughs> if I die, they won't have the money. You know? We were on a hike recently in North Carolina, and it's kind of the same thing, Jill. This is a pretty remote hike. Now, sure. it's possible you'd pass some people. Maybe you'd pass four people in, in two hours. Uh, but I I would see people wearing masks out on that trail. Uh-huh. And there'd be a couple of them. There are not ten of them. There are two, maybe three. And it just it struck me that what's the point of that? But You know, and you can argue if you go out on a hike. People who are hiking, they're breathing heavily. The droplets may travel further, and you may be at more risk. I don't think that's actually true, but it's a possibility. And they were actually caring about other people because you wear a mask to protect other people. So you should have said to them, thank you for doing this for me, even though I think you're an idiot. Thank you, and let's move on. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. It's uh, Sometimes... Um, I think that this whole thing about about how to interpret people with masks and the way these politics line up, unfortunately, and as you said this earlier, it's sad that it's become associated with political views. And I do suspect that many of the people who aren't wearing masks probably do take a very uh, independent, libertarian sort of uh, principled position in their minds. And, and and I know all you've said is correct about the, the health aspect. So it's a shame that it, it has become political to some extent, and it shouldn't be. It, it should simply be what's the right thing to do for my health. So it's not political. And I think, you know, this is the problem. We've made it political. It is not political. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize in the Wild West, everybody wore a mask and went out riding in the dust storms and stuff. And they thought it was <laughs> a lot of fun. And they were the heroes of all the movies I grew up in. <laughs> Anyhow, so quite honestly, it's a great thing to wear a mask. You're going to help other people, and you're not going to do any harm to yourself. I mean, you know, it's a no-brainer to wear a mask, quite honestly. And it's not political. It really is not political, uh, you know, and that's the problem. We've mm -hmm. made something political in this country that is not political. And as I said at the beginning, you know, Democrats have been equally as stupid as in New York, as have Republicans. This is not a single ability of politicians to be stupid. I think I've learned more in this last year about how stupid politicians can be than I could ever believe was true. You know, now now no politicians will speak to me either. But, <laughs> you know, but what can I say? <laughs> you know, you're in a position where you can, you know, you can speak without worrying about votes. <laughs> yes. That's very true. Uh, well, you know, with that, we've covered, we've actually kind of talked about the key things that I think are on our listeners' minds is, is you know, what can I do? What should I be doing? What can I expect in the future? 
Um, so it's it's always helpful to to drop back by and have a discussion, Dr. Morley. I can always count on your frank and candid. Uh, your sincere opinions. So, and we appreciate that. We always know where you stand. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, and your very informed opinions. So, we'd like to be able to circle back with you in another, say, three months or so, and and maybe we'll have some more optimistic things to talk uh, about. Hopefully, by that time, we can have a talk of yes. all the wonderful things you can do to enjoy aging and make sure that you get have a good aging time and not how to stop getting COVID in the meanwhile. You know, I mean, we have to recognize yeah. as well, which we didn't really touch on, but ageism has become a big deal in the COVID times. You know, the boomer remover came in, uh, you know, in Italy, they basically wouldn't put people over 65 on a ventilator. Uh, you know, we had the governor. In Spain, too. Yeah, we had the governor yeah. of Texas saying that older people, including himself, would volunteer to die so Americans don't lose our whole country. Uh, you know, healthy people huh. don't basically, uh, healthy young people uh, don't social isolate to protect their older relatives. We do stupid things. Older people are highly functional. We have our president, who's highly functional. We have the Dalai Lama. We have Pope Francis. And then my absolute heroine, uh, Queen Elizabeth, who I think is 98 now and still functions better than Boris Johnson. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a lot of respect for her. Yeah. Uh, she's had to suffer a lot, especially with her family. Oh, yeah. Well, I have no respect <laughs> oh. for the family. That's a, <laughs> that's a whole different yeah, show. Absolutely. Well, with that, we will wrap up. Uh, Dr. Morley, <laughs> it's been wonderful. We look forward to you talk, talking to you again. Okay, great talking to you guys, and it was fun, and I'm sorry for the half of the audience who got upset when I told them to wear masks. No, no, they'll be back. They'll be back. Yes. This has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.